In this video, I'm going to be explaining why pressure is not responsible for determining where gold or other materials are deposited in a creek, a river, and especially not in your sluice. G'day, welcome to Mad Scientist Prospecting. My name is Stuart Chignall, and this is the fifth episode in the series that I'm doing on the fluid dynamics of prospecting. To talk about and to explain why pressure is not responsible for determining where particles are deposited in a flow or deposited out of a flow, we need to go back to talking about the relationship between velocity and pressure. And that means going back to the bucket that we were using in episodes two and three. Now, I've got it set up almost exactly the same way. We've got the bucket, we've got the hose going flat out so that the water is overflowing. And because the water is overflowing at the top of the bucket, that means the water that's coming out of the bottom here is gonna be coming out at a constant flow, constant velocity, constant pressure. Most of the time, when people are talking about pressure, they talk about gauge pressure. And that's because most of the time, we don't care about atmospheric pressure. We wanna know how much pressure there is above atmospheric pressure. But for the kind of things that we're talking about here, we really need to talk in terms of absolute pressure. Because if you forget about atmospheric pressure, it can, it can make it harder to understand what's going on. Now, now in our bucket here, it's 300 mil deep. That means that from the, the depth of water, the weight of the water, there is a pressure at the bottom of the bucket from the water of 0 0.03 bar. But pushing back against the outlet, against that water pressure, is atmospheric pressure. And atmospheric pressure is one bar. It's a bit less here because we're you know, a ways above sea level. And the only reason we get water flowing out of the bucket is because we also have one bar of pressure pushing down on the surface of the water. So the pressure at the bottom of the bucket is actually 1.03 bar, whereas the pressure outside the outlet is one bar, which means we've got a pressure differential of 0.03 bar, give or take. And that's why we get water flowing out of the bucket. And I'm sure you guys would know that if we put an airtight lid on top of the bucket, we isolate the surface of the water in the bucket from the air pressure, then we don't get any water coming out of the bucket because the air pressure at the outlet is keeping all the water inside. One of the differences that I've got in this setup here is that I've got it positioned over this half blue barrel. The other difference is that I'm introducing into the bucket grains of sand, small gravels, and even some larger pea-sized gravel. And they're getting thrown to the other end of the half barrel, and you can see them collecting over there. And this is my first question. If pressure, specifically low pressure, is responsible for particles coming out of a flow and being deposited, why are none of these sand particles, gravel particles, and even pea-sized gravel particles falling out of the jet of water anywhere along here? Because the pressure that the surrounding pressure that they're traveling through is lower. The air pressure around the jet of water is one bar, whereas the pressure inside the flow is greater because it's got the dynamic pressure from the velocity of the flow. Now, you might think this is a stupid example because you're saying, well, of course, the particles are gonna get carried all the way through. But that's my point. They're not coming out of the jet stream even though it's a lower pressure area that the particles are traveling through. But there's something else going on as well, which makes this an even more dramatic example. We've talked about this in previous episodes, but whenever you have an obstruction stop, like you get to the end of the obstruction, or where a constriction on a flow is relieved, like when you have a, a narrow pipe and it broadens into a wider pipe, where that occurs, where the cross-sectional area through which the water is flowing gets larger, you have a lower, you have a, the creation of a low pressure area. And that's known as the Venturi effect. And at the outlet just here, 
surrounding the jet stream is a low pressure area created by this effect. And to show you that, so we're gonna make a Venturi with this. That didn't work, <laughs> the piece of pipe went up there. <laughs> Let's try that again. landed in the garden I can get that one it is a piece of larger pipe and all I'm gonna do is hold this over the jet stream now there might be a little bit of spray and a little bit of water dribbling out the end of the pipe but pre predominantly the jet is not touching the sides of this larger pipe it's just going straight through <laughs> Ah! Okay. Try again. Ow! Ow! Right. Out of matches. <laughs> and I locked myself out of the house. So yeah, this is one of the reasons why this video has taken a while to get published. Now, somewhere amongst my stuff, I have a commercially made Venturi, or rather a mixing nozzle, otherwise known as an eductor. Uh, one that looks like this. And it would have been great if I could have found the thing to demonstrate this effect because I could have just screwed it into the end of the hose, much easier to set up. And I had to use the hose because even though the Venturi effect is present whenever you have that change in velocity and would have been present at the outlet from the bucket, to get a demonstrable, visible suction from a Venturi, you need a very high difference in velocities. And you're not going to get that with the pressure delivered by only 300 millimeters depth of water. Now what I was trying to show, and would have been very easy to show with that eductor, is this. By the way, this is going to be a piece of a new sluice. Have your hose, and often, if you're trying to create this effect, you'll have a constriction just at the end of the hose, and that's called, you know, the, the, called the orifice. And then around it, you have your eductor, and if it's shaped, and then flared, you get a more efficient suction, but if it was a straight piece of pipe, it would still work. And when the water's jetting out here, just here is the low pressure zone. And because, especially if I was using the commercially made eductor, now this area of low pressure here is low lower pressure than here and since here is atmospheric pressure that means that this pressure just there is less than atmospheric pressure and that's why I wanted to include that little you know insert about talking about atmospheric pressure absolute pressure versus gauge pressure it was about was because of this because when you have a flow like this this area here is going to be less than atmospheric pressure and it exists in a ring around the orifice and what that means and what I was trying to show with the smoke and the flames was that you get a suction effect which brings air in this way and then throws it out with the uh, with the rest of the flow now that means that when we go and look at the flow of all those gravel particles coming out of the bucket through you know through the outlet they're not being affected by this low pressure zone at all at all they're just going straight past it and you might say okay well yeah but that's air 
it's different than water. Well, why is it different? Because the pressure there is less than atmospheric. And if, and if a particle is affected by low pressure, you would think it would come out at an area of pressure which is less than, even less than, the, is not just less than the water pressure, is less than the air, is even less than the air pressure. But you don't see that happening. Now, if it's low pressure that's responsible for uh, determining where particles are deposited, then in our sluice, we want to make sure that the pressure behind the riffle is minimised. And if it's minimised, we'll increase the effectiveness and efficiency of our sluice. And there's a really, really simple way of doing this. Because the bigger the difference in velocity between adjacent layers of water, the bigger the difference in pressure. So if we run our sluice flat out, super fast, then the pressure behind the riffles is going to be really, really low. In fact, we can very easily get it to the point where the pressure behind the riffle gets so low that we lower the pressure below atmospheric pressure. And when we do this, we can get a, uh, a gas bubble to form at the top of the low pressure zone behind the riffle. And uh, I'm sure you've seen this effect yourself. It's in a fast moving river, you look across the river, at the rocks and so on, and as the water's going over the top of a big rock, fast moving, you can often see a pocket of air forming underneath the flow. And that's because the flow and that difference in velocities creates that really big difference in pressures, lowers the pressure below atmospheric, and a whole stack of gases that are dissolved in the water, kept in the water by the air pressure while well, they come out of solution. And also a large proportion of that uh, gas that's in those bubbles is actually water vapour because it, the low pressure is so low the water is vaporising into that gas bubble. Now if you've got any experience with operating a sluice or have any instruction on how to run a sluice, you know that it's possible to run them too fast. And if you run them too fast, you get nothing. Which is of course why I'm talking about this, because it's to demonstrate that sluices don't work because of the low pressure zones they create. Now, if you've watched one, two, by the time you've watched three videos on alluvial prospecting, you would have heard the presenter talk about this model, this, this mental tool of how to predict where the gold's gonna be based on the low pressure zones. Often, the low pressure zones and the, where the gold is deposited are co-located. The gold isn't there because of the pressure, but it often you will find concentrations of gold at the same place you will find low pressure zones. Given that, why do I care? I care because it's only most of the time that the gold is co-located with the low pressure zone which leaves a significant portion of the rest of the time when the gold isn't at the low pressure zone. It might be next to it, or it might be quite some distance away. And if we know when that's going to be the case, if we can predict that, we're going to find more gold. The whole premise of this video series, and why I'm doing it, is that if you understand the physics better, you will find more gold faster and more efficiently. Now, many of those other YouTube presenters out there are much more experienced at prospecting than I am. Much more skill, they've got a lot more skills, a lot more experience, and they find, regularly find, not just historically have found, they regularly find more gold than I find. Because they're better prospectors than me. And so I'm not saying that you guys should ignore them or throw out what they're teaching. No. What I'm saying to you and to them is that if you take this theoretical knowledge, this better understanding of what's going on in, in, in a flow, you'll find more gold. And even with all their experience and skills, they will find more gold with a better understanding of what's happening. And you will find more gold if you take their practical knowledge and add this theory to it. And the reason for that is if you're looking at a river and you're trying to work out where you're going to dig, and you've got this better model of what's actually going on in the flow. There's a target up here. 
the low pressure zone and the gold, pretty sure the gold is going to be co-located with that low pressure zone. But over here, there's another low pressure zone. And you can see that the gold's not going to be deposited where the low pressure zone is. It's actually going to be deposited down there. Now if you've got a choice of which area you're going to dig, the second one is more likely to have a good amount of gold in it because every Tom, Dick and Harry is digging in the low pressure zone. So that one up there has probably already been dug not that long ago. And when I say not that long ago, could have been six months, could have been six years. But the one over here probably hasn't been touched until since the old timers. And that means that in, even in areas that have been flogged, there are going to be a number of honey holes which haven't been dug. And if you've got a better model of understanding of what's going on in the flow, you won't be looking for those honey holes based on luck. You can actually work out where they are and just go and dig them. But for that, you're gonna need a new model of how to predict where the gold is deposited. And that's what I'm going to be talking about in episode six. So if you don't want to miss that, make sure you subscribe, make sure you hit the bell notification because I've got a cool new toy that I'll be using to demonstrate what's going on. So catch you then and have fun and good luck finding people.